Well, welcome everybody. My name is John. I'm from Fola Capital, and I'm just so jacked that you all could make it today or you're watching the recording. Uh, we welcome you as well and look forward to hearing from you. I am joined by our three panelists. How are you guys doing? John. Doing great. Hey, John. Doing great. Good. We're all fired up because uh, we met earlier, an hour early before this, and we had a really good conversation going. So hopefully uh, we can share some of that with you during the formal part of today's event. Anyway, just a quick orientation to your screen. Some of you may notice we're not in a Zoom meeting, uh, so you will not be on video. You can all relax. But um, you can slide those boxes in your uh, monitor around. Um, you can make the slide presentation maximize if you don't want to look at our ugly mugs for too much longer. Um, or you can enlarge that if you'd like. But anyway, you can move the boxes around. You're not going to mess it up for anybody else. Along the side of your screen, you're going to see one little widget that's not um, already blown up for you, and that is the panelists widget. If you click on that, you can get into bios for all of us, all four of us. You can also get our contact information from that um, as well. So feel free to do that. That You can turn that on or off. If you have a question at any time, please put it in the Q&A widget you think you see below the presentation right there. And last but not least, uh, you have a resource list on the left side of your screen. There's a few items I'm going to mention. We're going to talk about some facts later on. Uh, I'm drawing from the reports that are in the resource list. I highly recommend you kind of click those links and download those things, uh, particularly the SEC reports that are at the top there. And I'll mention some of the other items there. But as I refer to those items a little bit later, perhaps uh, you have access to more of that data if you want to do a deep dive in any of that. But without any further ado, we're going to get going here. We want to get to the meat of uh, why you all signed up today. So I don't want to be an obstacle to that. So my name is John. Uh, I'm the CEO of Fola Capital. I'm also a veteran, Army veteran. Um, but as a we're in uh, Fola Capital is an SEC registered broker dealer. So we are regulated by the by FINRA, which is the regulating arm of the SEC. And we're registered with the SEC. You can check us out on Broker Check. If you want to check that out and we're duty bound to do things under the Securities Act of 1933 and we do that with our clients. But uh, part of that is to be fully disclosed issues around risk. And that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, this is a bit of a disclaimer. Um, some of our entrepreneurs that are on the panel today might might refer to projections or some things about their businesses that are that are they believe are to be true. And, and we believe to be true as well. <laughs> But in order to make an investment decision, if you ever lean towards making one, and these are any business, uh, you really should rely on the, the information that's contained on the offering sites and um, the written documentation that has been provided under the regulations and the Securities Act uh, through which do you then have enough information to make decisions. So that's what this paragraph's all about. Hopefully you've taken a moment to read it. If not, I'm going to pause for a few seconds and you can give it, give it a quick read. Thank you. So what we, one of the programs we have at Fola Capital is called a Valor Capital Group. Uh, it's pretty easy to belong to a Valor Capital Group. Uh, number one, you should probably be a veteran. And number two, just sign up. It's free. There's no obligation to invest or anything like that. Really, it's a growing number of people in the group some of which are here today that uh, have an interest in learning more about hmm, what's this thing about veterans starting businesses. And if they need some capital, might I think about stroking a check or helping them out and being an investor in their company? So basically, that's the thesis for the Valor Capital Group. Basically, you know, if we serve together, uh, maybe we're willing to invest together when we get out. <laughs> Uh, and invest in those among us that step out to form businesses and really ride their coattails along with them as they build wealth. Maybe we can build wealth together as a community of veterans. So that's the thesis of the Valor Capital Group. And that's kind of the backdrop for our discussion um, today. You know, it's kind of weird. I remember my own personal experiences. I could be deployed or whatever, and I could roll up to a totally strange unit, even a Marine unit, Carrie. And, you know, there's an instant bond and trust there and you're willing to like do stuff the military does without even thinking twice about it. And that's, you know, it's very tough to duplicate that in the civilian world. So we're trying to kind of bottle that up 
and trying to bring that into the civilian world in some ways as a backdrop for potentially creating at scale this ability to raise capital within the group. So that's the premise of it. Uh, it's a work in progress, clearly, but like anything else we've done as entrepreneurs and, and veterans, um, you know, we're, we're designing it as we go. So thank you for being a member of it. If you are already, if not, it takes you one minute to sign up on our website if you want to join it. So um, next, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce the panel. Each of them has one slide and uh, they're all kind of looking the same, the slides in terms of the information that's on there. And really, we've designed this so that you as an attendee can get a flavor for the diversity among the three companies here, learn a little bit about the entrepreneur behind them and what they're trying to do. So with that, I'm going to start off with Rally Point Grill and Carrie. So Carrie, over to you. Thanks, John. I really appreciate that. And thanks for having me on the, the webinar today. Super excited to talk a little bit about our company and the capital that we're looking to raise and why. And so I just want to tell you a little bit that uh, my husband and I are retired Marines and, and I find it interesting to be on the panel with the rest of these Army guys out there. And uh, John, I appreciate you letting me come in and kind of raise the standards a little bit. So that's good. You know, it's like it's important to have a Marine on board. Um, in any event, my husband and I are retired Marines, and in 2015, we had a just radical idea to start a restaurant in Woodstock, Georgia, which is on the north side of Metro Atlanta. We didn't have any experience in starting the restaurant whatsoever, um, but we set out to make it happen with a, with a whole objective of failure is not an option. We just knew that we were going to figure out how to do this. And interestingly enough, we've all experienced the whole rise and fall of 2020 and the pandemic. But it was in 2020 when we really first started getting a hold of what we really had our hands on and understanding what we meant to the community. And the reason we figured that out is because during that period of time in the spring of 2020, the community had disappeared by force of the government. And so when we saw them start to come back, we started to realize the impact that we made in our community. And I can put it to you this way for the veterans that are out there listening. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier is that when we transition out of the military, it, it really doesn't matter if it's been, you know, 30 days or, you know, a year like Jeremy on the panel with me or even even 50 years. It just doesn't matter that as veterans, we come to a point in time often in that period of time where we feel like we just don't fit in out here. We are missing the camaraderie of our of our military buddies and our veteran friends and whatnot. And so Rally Point Grill actually created that environment where veterans can come in and they can feel welcome and they feel honored. And it just, it really, like I said, it really showed itself in 2020, how important that was for our community. And it's right around that time when we realized that we have figured out how to run this restaurant successfully. We understand the immense impact, positive impact we have on the community. And we felt like we could take this system and we could duplicate it and we could put Rally Point Grill all across the nation. So starting out, we're looking in the Southeast and we're looking out, you know, out to the major military installations that are out there so that we've got the support of the veteran, a, a really concentrated veteran and military community. Our first, fran excuse me, our first franchise opened up in Evans, Georgia, outside of what we now call Fort Eisenhower. They opened up in June of last year and they have duplicated everything that we're doing and they're feeding the souls of our veterans, not just their bellies. And so as we progress forward, one of the things that we found out very quickly is that as veterans, we don't often have the same network net worth as our counterparts do. And without net worth as a startup organization, it's extremely difficult to find capital. Make it even worse so after COVID that when you're trying to run a restaurant, there's not a lot of banks and lending institutions out there that want to lend to a restaurant. But we feel passionate that this is what we're called to do and that we can really impact the lives of our veterans and communities all across the nation. So therefore, we decided to look to other alternatives. And John's going to tell us a lot more about how all of this all works. But we have a side by side offering where we're doing a regulation D. We're raising one point two million dollars. And the reason for the goal for that, the goal behind that is that's the capital we need to help start up three more franchises. In the restaurant franchise world, you get to five restaurants and you've got what's called proof of concept. And it starts to open up more opportunities for our veterans. But in order to get there, we're going to have to self-fund those. Now, what's great about self-funding those is that we're reducing the risk for us and we're reducing the risk for our investors as well, because between the, between the caveat that we have on the lease with a landlord and the fact that we're lending them the money, should something happen to that organization, 
that all falls back to us. It doesn't get caught up in the bank. And so we've got to reduce risk. We're offering a debt structure with a revenue, revenue share program whereby you get paid back over the next few years sharing the revenue with us so that it's not breaking the backs of our restaurant owners. And with our side-by-side -side offering, we're, we're open to every type of investor out there. It doesn't matter what your net worth is. You can invest with us in the Reg CF at $100. You can invest with us in the Reg D506 at $10,000. So we've got, we offer something for everybody out there. And, you know, and ultimately, John, I know a lot of investors are looking for that unicorn, but the truth is a franchise and a restaurant franchise is slow and steady. We're not a unicorn. We're slow and steady, but we're going to be there. And with a debt financing structure like we've got, we're slow and steady for a period of time. So again, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate being here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Carrie. Good stuff. Good stuff. Up next is uh, Paul Hussar, one of my buddies. Go ahead, Paul. Hey, thanks, John, for hosting us. And it's great to be on the panel with these uh, great companies and great teammates here. So VetCore, in its essence, is a restoration company. Uh, we do water, fire, mold, that type of stuff. We're in a recession-proof, pandemic-proof, inflation-proof environment. Team VetCore is the company we're raising money for. It's a holding company that facilitates the franchising of of vet core and in in its essence um we're trying to create opportunities for fellow veterans their family members and those who share similar values so we're not exclusive to veterans but our policy is veterans and those who share similar values we were founded in 2013 in tampa so we've been in the restoration industry for 11 years we started franchising in 2019 with tremendous organic growth about six months before COVID, and that created some challenges for us for uh, about two years plus uh, in selling franchises. Franchisers make money through selling franchises and royalties on franchise revenue. So now we're looking to get some operating capital on the books to get us on, on the balance sheet now, to get us to the magic point in franchising and service industries, anywhere between 50 and 100 units. For us, it'll be closer to 50 units that gets us to the point of royalty revenue sustainability. And that creates the irreversible momentum that we need to get us to where we need to go. So we're, we started a 506C Reg D placement. We're trying to raise $1.7 million in growth capital. And what that does, it's it's through a convertible bond, five-year um, convertible bonds offered at prime plus two interest rate, $25,000 minimum investment with $5,000 increments beyond that. And what happens is that the five years will pay semi-annual interest on that. And after five years, the bondholders get their money back, it, it, earning passive income at prime plus two throughout. If in the five years we have a sale or a major strategic investment, the bondholders have the opportunity to convert to equity at one of two ways. The minimum that they would earn is 20%. They convert at a discount of 20%. So if you invest $100,000, your bond would convert to $120,000 in equity. Or if the valuation is greater than $25 million, the bondholders convert to equity and they ride the cap table, which would be greater than 25, greater than 20 percent uh, return on their investment when they convert it to equity. We believe that's a really fair uh, and reasonable rate to, to have a passive income, but also an opportunity to capitalize on the upside, all while creating opportunities for veterans. And that's our passion. Our vision really is to become the premier private employer through our franchise network of hiring veterans and the brand known for timely, quality, reliable service. I'll close with really our three differentiators. One, it's the, it's the brand, it's veterans. But don't hire us because we're primarily veteran owned, veteran operated, that'd be a handout, no veteran wants a handout. But because we're primarily veteran owned and operated, we show up fit, polite, on time, actually early, because early is on time and on time is late. We treat others with dignity and respect. And that's a differentiator in the home services industry. It differentiates our brand and our brand promise from all the others. The second is when you think about franchising, it's all about training, standardizing, and replicating. You know any institutions that have a good reputation at training, standardizing, and replicating? And as a result of that, we've earned a great reputation with 11 TPAs, third-party administrators, who administer claims on behalf of insurance companies. And so we're able to get our franchisees credentialed immediately upon grand opening. So that does two things that brings them reps and revenue right away with zero cost of acquisition. And then with each one of those claims comes an insurance agent, an insurance adjuster, inside claim staff, 
oftentimes a re re regional field manager. Those become future referral sources for future claims. And they have the ability to do referral marketing with realtors, agents, adjusters, property managers, apartment managers. And that differentiates our brand again. And the last is catastrophic response, which I call the icing on the cake. For seven out of the last nine years, we've earned uh, over $2 million managing catastrophe response. So as I mentioned, the industry itself, home services, recession-proof, pandemic-proof, inflation-proof, dishwashers, ice makers, hot water heaters, air conditioning units, roof leaks, kitchen fires, all those things happen. But what happens when there's a, um, a fran a, excuse me, a, a, a hurricane or a catastrophe, we mobilize our franchise network. We command and control that network at the franchise or level. We allow our franchisees to operate outside their territories or ride to the sound of the guns and help people in their time of need, which allows them to earn a significant amount of revenue in a short period of time while protecting consumers against predatory contractors and helping our insurance carriers and partners maintain and lower their cost of claims for things. And that creates a win-win-win environment. So really, those are our three differentiators in our brand and in our industry. And we believe that's one of the reasons why you should consider investing in VetCorp. So thanks very much, Sean. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Paul. Good stuff. And that win-win-win is really uh, cool. I've heard that a few times. I used to work for an insurance company, and it's uh, very unique. So uh, good stuff there, Paul. Thank you. And then uh, last but not least is uh, Jeremy with Crosswood. Jeremy, over to you. John, thanks for having me today. It's great to be here on the panel with Paul and, and Carrie and allowing me to present Crosswood here today. So Crosswood is, is a mass timber manufacturer and mass timber is, is a new construction material that is, that is coming on scene here in the United States. It's really expanding very rapidly. And really what it does is it replaces steel and concrete. I have a sample right here behind me um, in, in construction. And What's unique to Crosswood is we're actually using our locally sourced materials here in the Appalachian region and hardwoods. And our mission is to become the first hardwood mass timber manufacturer in North America. We were funded, or excuse me, founded in 2023. And as Carrie alluded to, so I retired at the end of 22. And, you know, as I was transitioning out, as we all do, you know, that started about two years prior to that. And just the, the short story on how Crosswood came to be, my initial goal was to transition out as as a contractor and just begin building homes i've always been drawn to that i do have a real estate you know background and i was exposed to, to cross laminated timber and mass timber and i could not get the panels so we started looking into manufacturing some panels and really we've been uh you know we've been connected to a lot of different partners in that journey and it's really kind of taken off from there we have numerous partners uh, across the hardwood industry a lot of the universities have come on board to support Crosswood and our efforts to use our locally sourced timber here in, in, in the construction of mass timber buildings. We were awarded a $1 million USDA grant. Uh, that has been very beneficial for us as, as we've continued to solve some of the challenges uh, that, that we've been, that's been faced uh, within the hardwood industry and, and how to incorporate hardwoods, which is traditionally visually graded lumber into a structurally graded material for incorporation into hardwood mass timber. Um, DOD contracts, that's another unique value proposition that, that Crosswood brings. Uh, we anticipated, you know, the DOD kind of adopting mass timber. We knew they were looking at that uh, due to its, uh, you know, its, its excellent strength characteristics, its rapid deployability, flexibility for installation. They did uh, come out with an, with an ECB, an engineer construction bulletin in September of 23. And you can find all these on Crosswood's website under our resources tab, which uh, directs the, the Department of Defense to, to uh, incorporate mass timber in all DOD-wide construction projects beginning in FY27. And another unique value position that Crosswood presents is we will be the only better known mass timber manufacturer slash supplier in the United States. So we, we feel very strongly that we're, that we're positioned very well to capture a lot of those DOD contracts moving forward. Our capital campaign. So what we have coming to offer is a Reg D506 Charlie. Our goal is $10 million and the use of funds there is going to be for our initial equipment order. Uh, one of the, the main benefits of the FOLA capital offering in addition to the 10 million capital raised initially is we're also looking at a reg a in 2025 and what's really good about that is it really aligns with our progression as a company one of the challenges that we have is the long lead times in this mass timber manufacturing equipment 
Um, we're looking at 16 to 18 months from the day that we signed the purchase order for them to build that. It all does come out of Europe uh, until it hits the ground here in Virginia, and then we commission that. Um, so that Reg A really aligns well for that for that 16 to 18 month timeline. Uh, it's going to be a prime plus two, a five year term, a fifty thousand dollar minimum investment, twenty percent discount on the future round, and and we have a valuation cap at forty million dollars, which we feel is very beneficial to our early investors. Um, the value that the, these other very large mass timber manufacturers are in north of uh, fifty million, so we we believe that forty million dollar cap is uh, is very beneficial, uh, credit investors only, and then again speaking to the the bottom bullet there on our slide, that Reg A. I really, you know, that's, that's again, I speak back to that. That's one of the benefits, you know, for us, it's so hard to raise capital, as we all know, and, and the flexibility that FOLA brings to us that, that allows us to initial, you know, with that convertible bond option at 10 million, allows us to execute that equipment order and then the roll into that Reg A in 2025. Uh, it's just, it, it aligns so well with, with our growth as a company here. Um, you know, we're very excited about the future of Crosswood. Um, there's a, we have buildings that are being planned. Uh, with, there's a strong European market for these mass timber panels. Uh, yellow poplar is, is the initial hardwood species that we are looking at. Um, we're looking at additional hardwood species as well with, as we collaborate with our other hardwood industry leaders. Um, I'll share this. I haven't really published this yet, but we're also looking at uh, the red alder species, which is a very beautiful um, lumber and, and, you know, we just get really excited here at Crosswood whenever we can, we can see the future and, you know, building these beautiful buildings out of, out of hardwood, you know, lumber. So thanks again, John. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. So as you can probably deduce, if you're in the audience, there's three very different kinds of businesses here, but one thing in common, we're all veterans trying to raise capital for each of our businesses. So, as a moderator, um, I have some questions for the panel, but if anybody in the live audience has a question, uh, feel free to um, introduce it in the Q&A widget you have in front of you, and I'll be glad to work it into the, uh, the Q&A. We don't have all day, but um, we'll see if we can do that if anybody submits one. Um, so first question, guys, for the panel is, um, you know, you've been raising capital now for some time, some longer than others. Um, what have you learned to date about raising capital as a veteran owned business? And you know, I'm going to kind of rotate who takes the lead on these questions. And since you went first, Carrie, uh, let me let me ask Paul to start off with that question. What, what have you learned to date about raising capital as a veteran owned <laughs> business? It's hard. <laughs> it's hard and it takes time. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned in this transition to this new civilian life is uh, about wealth building and um you know what i've learned is the key to building wealth is not by how much salary you make right it, it's the people who are wealthy in this country uh are wealthy because they either are, they either own companies or they own real estate and most people build their own wealth through fractions of people's companies through the stock market and i know you're going to talk later about how there's better ways to do that and this is one of those better ways. You can actually really build wealth by investing in private companies, but people just don't understand that. It's 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 foreign to them. They don't understand the concept. They think you gotta have stock, et cetera. Um, and they don't understand the concept of that. And so I find myself a lot of times educating people about this Reg D exception. What is this 506C thing? And uh, more people are eligible than, than you would think. So that's one of the key things um, that I've learned is, is you've really got to educate people and it takes time to do that. Great, Paul. Uh, good points. Um, Jeremy, what do you think? What have you learned? Um, you know, just a caveat off of what Paul, you know, it's very hard. It's very difficult to raise capital. And one of the things that I'll present also is, is, I mean, you have three solid business models here, proven business models with, with the franchises here, Crosswood, you know, we feel like we have a very, you know, we, we have a solid model with a with a, a validated revenue projections and, and given all that, you know, we, we have a lot of cheerleaders here at Crosswood. We have so many supporters, um, you know, from from up and down, you know, the industry, from architects to developers to contractors. Everybody wants to build with Mass Timber and, you know, you, you go and you drop this this model, it, have it 
getting folks to the table to actually, you know, finalize those investments, it, it is, it is, it is a challenge and it, it really takes a team. And, you know, that's, that's where we were, we're really excited to work with, with FOLA and, you know, our veteran, you know, group and veteran community, um, you know, to, to bridge that gap, but it, it, it is, it is tough. Can I, can I just add cheerleaders are nice, but investors are better, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, you know, understand the business model, listen to the people that, that you're, that are given the pitch, look at the numbers. If you understand the numbers and then ask yourself, are you willing to ride the jockey? Are you willing to ride the jockey and bet on the jockey? Yeah. Great points. Great points. Love that. Kerry, how about you? I think uh, of the three of us, you've been uh, at it the longest, but what have you learned? Oh, John, where to start? What have I learned? You know, um, I, I learned a, a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I really learned very quickly is to be bank ready uh, and having my company ready to go to a lender was, was one thing that I learned. Another thing that I learned is that there are lots of different types of lenders out there and some of them you will fit in their portfolio, others you will not. Um, and so, you know, learning something like that to um, ultimately learning that I don't really fit in just about anybody's portfolio. Um, thank you, COVID-19 and restaurants who went out of business, but you know, we survived. Um, you know, and I think the other the other thing that I, I learned too is is to, you know, reiterate what, what both of the other two said is it is not an easy area to navigate. Um, and And quite honestly, I don't think it really matters if you're a veteran or not. It's just hard to find capital. It's hard to get the lenders to open up and and invest and, and get the money going to you. And one thing that, you know, if we've got veterans that are listening, particularly veteran business owners that are listening, I see this all over social media all the time. Everybody's looking for that veteran business loan. It doesn't <laughs> exist, right? <laughs> but if you look at what John's presenting with these three companies in this portfolio, that's exactly what we're looking for the veteran business loan. And so, you know, finding this alternate source and this different way of raising capital and working together with my network, with other people's networks to find the people who, who want to invest and make a difference in veterans' lives um, has been an incredible journey. There's just, there's so much that I've learned, John, just so much, but it's hard. Yeah, it certainly is hard. And, and I would agree with you, uh, raising money, Anyway, is hard veteran or not? Um, anyway, I can't remember that. It's a good segue though. The second question I have for you is: uh, I think you started to touch on this, Carrie. Um, so maybe we'll start with you. Uh, why did you decide to design your own security offering for the capital campaign you're offering right now? So unlike um, Jeremy and Paul, who have bonds, convertible bonds, you have a revenue share agreement. Um, you know, what, what led you to that? I know you had some help, but like, what, what was the thought process be? And you have an equity like kicker, not to steal your thunder, but talk to us the thinking that went behind your approach. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So as, as we're building the franchise, uh, the prospect database I have is really, really deep. Uh, and I've got a number of qualified prospects for franchises that, that have the food service industry experience, uh, but they're lacking the capital. And so that that was the number one step is to be able to, to create a fund where we could provide that. And then secondarily in that the restaurant industry is volatile. Let's face it. There's there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the restaurant industry. And it's volatile. Uh, and so creating the revenue share agreement gave us an opportunity to have the investors ride along on the journey with the franchisee owners. And so there's certain months out of the year that are really excellent and really profitable. There are other months out of the year that are a little bit dry, like January when everybody's paying off their credit card bill and August or September when the kids are going back to school. And so by having the revenue share program, we're not overtaxing each one of our, our franchisees so that, because honestly, if you have a fixed, if you have a fixed requirement that you need to give back to your lender, in, with today's rates and today's economics, $100,000 can run you anywhere from $2,500 to almost $5,000 a month. And on a slow month, that's gonna kill an owner. And you have two of those back to back and it's gonna kill an owner. So the revenue share program really gave us the opportunity to ride the ebbs and flows, the, the cycle, the business cycle of a restaurant. And then secondarily, 
we've put the equity kicker in there so that it's not really just debt financing. It's if we we really get a hold of this and someone comes along and gives us the right offer to be able to take this and and really build the dream of building it all across out all across the nation and we decide to sell it, then this converts into an equity kicker. And my investors also share in some of those equity up earnings as well. So it's it's a it's a win win all the way around. Um, you know, and the flip side of it is, is the smaller one, my reg CF. The idea behind that is that is really a local that's for our local store here in Woodstock, Georgia, to be able to do some improvements and some add ons for that. And what's great about it is I also recognize that my franchisees are going to be able are going to need to do reg CFs. And so this gives us an opportunity to work through the entire process and the mechanisms behind doing a reg CF to be able to then share that with our franchisees and help them get out of the lenders that are out there that consistently say no and get into the opportunities where they can find capital. So it's it's a it's a lot of things going on um, and a lot of reasons why we chose to go this direction. But I feel really confident that through through the connectivity and the support of the veteran community specifically, that we're going to find the ones who see what we're trying to accomplish and will jump in in one level or another. Yeah, that's great. And I love how you thought about exercising the model so that your franchisees can use Reg CF locally. I thought I love that. In fact, when you're not around, I'm going to say that was my idea in the future, just to let yeah, you know. Sure. But, um, but uh, good stuff. Paul, uh, let's go back to you. What um, you know, what what was your thinking behind your your security offering? And, and same kind of question. What kind of thoughts? Yeah, Really, there are five reasons, primarily. The first one was we had to achieve our objective. So my, my CFO is sitting right here with me. We, we looked at, we developed a pro forma with the very conservative assumptions um, to look out, you know, when we thought we would get to royalty revenue, sustainability, how many franchises per year, that kind of thing. And so we had to achieve the objective. How much money do we need to get on the balance sheet now to get us to royalty revenue, sustainability, that magic mark? with very conservative assumptions for franchise sales, storm revenue, all that kind of stuff. The second piece was it had to be suitable, feasible, acceptable. It had to uh, you know, pass the fast test for us and it had to be affordable. So we had to be able to make sure that we could cover the debt service. Again, we looked at the, the performer and make sure that we could cover that. The third piece is we wanted to cover, we wanted to create a very competitive rate of return for investors. Um, this isn't the most attractive investment, but it's very reasonable. It's very fair compared to the market right now. The fourth thing is we wanted people to be able to share in the potential upside. So with a conversion to equity allows people to ride our success as well. Um, so if, if you look at it this way, the very least you're going to do is in five years, you're going to get your money back at, with a passive income at prime plus 2% locked in. And then the, if we have a sale or significant investment in the future, the very least you'll get is a 20% return on your money when you convert from uh, the debt instrument to equity. And then lastly, we want to be able people to be able to do something with their money that feels good. So look, a ton of people out there give to veteran related charities and service organizations, and they're giving that money away, right? We're, we're a company with a cause and a company on a mission to create further uh, sustainable, meaningful employment opportunities and now business ownership opportunities for veterans who in turn are only going to hire more veterans, statistically proven. Vets mm -hmm. hire more vets. So you can invest in us recognizing we're doing good things for veterans while still making a very reasonable rate of return and ride the upside with us. And, and so it's not just a giveaway of your money to a veteran service organization, but it's a, an investment of your money in fellow veterans for fellow veterans. Excellent stuff. Good stuff. Jeremy, what, what are your thoughts? What led you to offer what you're offering? Yeah, sure, John. Thanks. Um, you know, I don't think I can say it much better than Paul. He just gave an excellent, you know, explanation on, you know, the debt conversion to equity. It gives our investors options. It gives them flexibility. And, um, you know, really why we chose, you know, the convertible bond was for those reasons to give our investors that option from debt to equity to, you know, just as Paul was saying, you know, at a minimum, they're going to get that money back at the end of that five years, or they can convert that into equity and, and, and benefit from, from the progress of the company. And then speaking to the Reg A, you know, again, I spoke to it in my initial comments there that just really aligns well with Crosswood's 
progression. You know, that's just uh, the nature of the beast that we're, that we're looking at with, with mass timber. There's no way around that. That's really been a challenge with the 16 to 18 month lead time for, for the equipment to arrive. Um, the equipment is very, very expensive, as you can imagine. Um, we don't need, you know, 100% of the cost of that equipment up front. It's kind of staggered in there over the 18 months, right? So it's been, it's just a really flexible way um, to allow us to meet our goals, um, our funding goals. Great. Thanks. Um, a question has come in. I'm going to uh, relay to you guys. It's a two part question. And I think it's a great question. Uh, I'm going to answer the first part for the sake of expediency. And then the second part, you guys can chime in. Uh, here's the question. Uh, are all the instruments debt regardless of conversion at five years? And this, that's the part I'll answer. Uh, and then the second one is, are entrepreneurs open to equity investments? And I can't answer for you guys, but so that's the one I'll, I'll go around the table on. But let me answer the first one first as you guys think about it. Yes, the answer are, is all debt. And as um, carries is a revenue share agreement that has an equity-like kicker, Paul and Jeremy's structures are similar in that they're convertible bonds that mature. Um, and then at the option of the investor can convert in equity under certain circumstances that are good for the investor. So there it's convertible to equity. So that's uh, the answer is yes to that first question. And uh, for all the reasons we stated, and if I could just chime in a personal opinion, uh, you know, I've been at this for a long time and, and part of the drawbacks of traditional investing as an investor is you're kind of trapped in that deal till they sell. <laughs> I mean, there's no shortage of stories where um, investors become frustrated because they're stuck in some fund where there's been no exits. And, um, you, you know, so that there's nothing wrong with that model. There's plenty, as we'll get into in a few minutes, plenty of money goes into that model. But when you were raising money, what I call the modern way, you know, having a hybrid approach where newer types of investors that don't historically invest want to put their money into something that where it's not going to be trapped because they can't afford it to be trapped, many of these investors. Uh, but it gives them some advantages of, of being equity as well through the conversion feature. So that's the long-winded answer to the first part. But I love the second part, which is our entrepreneurs open equity investments. And Paul, let me start with you on this one. And uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would have to be the right fit, the right partner, um, you know, a fair arrangement, that kind of thing. One of the reasons I chose this is I didn't have a network where I could reach out that I felt like I could get um, an equity partner. Uh, since then, I have been connecting and they tell two friends and so on and so on. And so there are some potential discussions. And, you know, you would help me un understand this as as we go on this campaign, I'm not prohibited from doing something else. I would just have to disclose it to all the investors appropriately, etc. So, I didn't have that network to really reach out to consider really an equity partner. Um, but now I, I'm certainly open to it as if our cultures, norms, values aligned um, and, and the right partner came along. Thanks, Paul. How about you, Carrie? You know, I'm, I'm gonna really have to say exactly what Paul said. It comes down to finding that right investor, investor that's the right fit. Um, you know, in, in our particular situation, raising 1.2 million to to put in a pool to turn around and reinvest to other franchisees gets a little more complicated because, you know, then then you're look. I'm looking for investors that are that are wanting to partner almost at two levels, and so that becomes way more complicated. So therefore, you know, investment opportunities with us would probably be more at the store level. Um, but again, you know, reiterating what Paul said, it, it has to be the absolute right person. It has to be the right deal. Uh, it has to be the right situation, the good fit for both the investor and the franchisee at that point. So in my case, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, but I, at this point, I've also understand in the quest for capital, never say no to anything until you learn more information. Thanks, Carrie. And lastly, Jeremy, over to you. Yeah, you, thanks, John. Yeah, absolutely. We are open to uh, to equity investments. Um, just as the panel, you know, already said, you know, it'd have to be the right terms and the right partnerships. Strategic partnerships is what we really look for here at Crosswood. Uh, we've developed quite a few of those over the, the last few months. We like to, to work with folks who are aligned uh, in some way, you know, within the industry and, and they stand to, you know, they, they not only bring us value, but we in turn can create value for them as well, such as a developer or, or you know, a lumber supplier or something 
somewhere along those lines. But strategic partnerships are, are a big plus, but we are open to equity investments. And then just to go back to our to our campaign, that, that $10 million convertible bond, if that were to convert fully into equity, that would be 25% equities um, potentially into Crosswood right there. So absolutely, we, we are open to that. Yeah, that's great. So um, i got time for one more question that came in that's worth asking here, um, and I'm going to ask it. And Jeremy, I'm going to kind of be a dictator here and, and, and single you out because I think you have a pretty good answer to this one. Um, and the question is, can you share a uh, – they're saying self-inflicted, but I don't think you, it's self-inflicted. Can you share a self-inflicted wound during your fundraising that you now recognize and won't repeat? you have a story that comes to mind there? Yeah, I do, John. Thanks, thanks for uh, bringing up that old wound there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I've learned so much, and you know, I got to, you know, I thank John and his team for really kind of, you know, teaching me as we all try to navigate these these investment waters. So early on, um, you know, when we were as we were, you know, pushing Crosswood forward, I was approached by a developer. Um, that, that was into building uh they wanted to build a few buildings and uh it it aligned very well with us and the initial terms that we agreed to um was was favorable initially um and then as as progressions as things progressed and time went on um they kind of fell apart but you know it got really you know the waters were muddy because we were already we were under a verbal agreement we had signed a few things so it really kind of put us you know in a tough spot there fortunately um you know we were able to rectify that situation and bring in some some additional investors and you know all parties were you know satisfied at the end of that but um yes we will make sure to to fully vet you know any and all in the investment opportunities and and just look at that very thoroughly um, it's just got to be a good fit, right? And really, um, you know, we're, we like relationships, right? I think all veterans do. We're, we're big on relationships. You know, there's a lot of camaraderie. And, and as us in veterans, we look for the same in our partners. I mean, we can, you know, when we meet folks, we, we can we initially, we, we can kind of tell, you know, are they going to be a good fit for our company? You know, or do we like these guys? Do they share the same values that we do? Just really, you know, stay true, true to that. Um, speaking to to any other veterans that may be watching, trying to, you know, kick off their own, you know, business. Um, stay true to your values, and then that'll help you kind of alleviate some of those mistakes. Yeah, thanks for that. So, uh, just to add to the conversation, um, and then we're gonna. I'd like to spend the rest of the like ten minutes or so, uh, just kind of laying the groundwork for if you're a listener or in the audience, ways to think about investing in a private business that you might not have thought about before. But before we get there, you know, there's a concept in the military. I'm sure you guys have heard it. Uh, you know, let the situation develop. It's one of my most favorite concepts or gifts the military gave me. And what happens when we launch a campaign like the three here is they take on a life of their own. And um, what happens is, and some of your questions that came in are based on it, which prompted me to make this statement. You know, I think any entrepreneur uh, is open to any idea any investor would have. And one of the nice things about an active campaign is that is plan A. We're going to fund our business with plan A. We got a plan for that. But if some investor comes along and says, for example, hey, Jeremy, I'll give you a check for 40, 40 million today. Right. I really love what you're doing. You're, you're probably going to have a coffee with that person <laughs> and hear what they have to say. And you have every right in the world to to take that um, offer if you want to take it. Nothing prohibits you from doing that. And had it not been for your active campaign, that discussion may not have ever entered into uh, reality for you. So I think I've seen that in this business over and over again. So one of the positive side effects, if you're a veteran raising money this way, is you put the ball in play and then you let the situation develop and some wonderful things happen. And uh, both on the good news and bad news side and on the good news side, sometimes you get offers that you never really thought you might have to contemplate and you can decide to take them or not. But uh, look, panelists, thanks. We can go on and on and on all day. I think you really whet the appetite. Uh, really appreciate uh, the thoughts that you had. I, I do want to just uh, spend the next 10 or 15 minutes that we have left just kind of setting some baseline concepts for the audience and uh, ways to think about a potential investment in a private company. You know, um, there's a big difference between the words supporter and investor. Uh, if you come into my 
garage on a during football season and see the idiots hanging out in my garage watching football and and, and then you say hey how many of you are investors they would probably throw empty beer cans at me but if i ask them hey how many of you are supporters of x right the word supporter has a whole different meaning than investor so if, you, if we're thinking about investing in a private business ask yourself do i support this business or not and if the answer is yes one way you can support them is by investing in them. So if we think about ourselves as supporters first, um, that that gets us halfway down the pipe. If it's just food for thought for you for some ways to consider it. But a, a few models I'd like to share with you because I, I deal with this every day. One of the challenges with raising capital um, in this what I call the modern way, which is really fueled by the internet, is more and more people have an opportunity to do so, but we're just not used to it. And there's several reasons for that. So. For, with conventional investments, we think about the public stock markets, which have stocks to buy, as well as uh, government uh, and corporate bonds. And then we are, we're all familiar with what banks offer us, what we can do with our money, like money markets and stuff like that. So we're all familiar with that. But when it comes to what's called alternative investments, uh, you know, that's a classification of investments called alternatives. It's their alternatives to the public opportunities to invest. Most of us are unfamiliar with it. One of the of the three that are listed here, real estate's probably the one we're most familiar with. That's because the government never said that you have to have a certain what net worth threshold to buy real estate. So we know lots of people that have bought real estate and have real estate today. I know there's one in the audience right now that's like a real estate king here in North Carolina and he knows who he is. But anyway, um, you know, what we're talking about today, these three examples are what's called private placements and they are investments in privately held companies. And it traditionally has been the domain of angels, venture capital and private equity. And then you have the bottom list. There were very few of us participate in unless we're ultra wealthy. But, you know, why does this matter? Look, give you a little bit of a history lesson here. I'm going to do it in, in a minute or less. One of the links you have in your resource list is a 17 minute video we've done. It's kind of like a TED talk. Uh, it's on our YouTube channel. That, that's the longer version of what I'm gonna summarize here in a minute. Um, if you go back to 1933, what happened after the great crash of 1929, which led to the Securities Act of 1933, while the intentions were good with the law of the land that still exists today that govern how you do private placements, it had unintended consequences. So what happened in 1933, it's still a great act. It still keeps you know, things regulated and, and, and fair for everyone in most cases. But what it did was it, it created a set of rules at the federal level that said you have to follow these rules um, in order to raise money from the public. And that's all the rules you need to do to go public on the public exchanges. But the government was, uh, when they wrote the law, was smart enough to know that 100% that of the time that's not going to apply. So they came up with this thing called exemptions. The first one was Reg A, the second one was Reg D, Reg D came out in the 80s. And what I like to say is, and there's more in the video, we have basically have been through three kind of phases of private placements in this country. The first one was all manual, there was no technology, and it was mostly wealthy people participating in the very few private placements that occurred for decades. In the 80s, computerization came on board, and a new... Uh, private placement called Reg D, which is the, does the lion's share of stuff these days are Reg Ds, three of which are represented here today. Um, that came out and, and we saw more growth. But the, really what I want to get to is in 2012, a new exemption called Reg CF came onto the scenes. And what's really unique about that exemption is two things. There's two unique things about it. Number one, for the first time since 1933, the government said, you know what? It's not 1933 anymore. We can uh, regulate this stuff with technology now at scale. So we're going to let anyone now invest in a private business again, like they could do before 1933. That's what made it unique. And the second thing that made it unique is they said, you have to use the internet uh, to offer a reg CF, but you don't have to use the internet for a reg D or a reg A, but here's the news flash. If you do, wonderful things can happen. And that's where the disruption is taking place, folks. The internet, as in the case, in all three cases here with their Reg Ds, is opening up opportunity to invest in private companies like never before. And it's just, the internet is disrupting the, the process of raising capital, just like it's disrupted every other aspect of our lives. 
just want to bring up a couple points out of this report. You have a link to this report in the resource list. This report is put out by the SEC. They have an office of the Advocate for Small Business Capital Formation. There's also a link to an investor hub that the SEC maintains. Very few people know about. It's a great resource. But anyway, let's take a look at what's in this report. There's two things in particular. This graph shows how much money was raised through IPOs over the last year before this report was written. Excuse me. <clears throat> As you see, there's record few number of IPOs. And if you go back to those two half years and you total it up, it's $16 billion with a B. But let's take a look at, this is another page out of that same report. This shows you proportionately how much money was raised in this country for businesses that are not public or did not go out on a public exchange under those rules to, to, to generate capital. Let's start with Reg D 506 Cs. We have three of them here today. $169 billion was raised under that one exemption. That's 10 times the amount of money that was raised through IPOs. How about 506 Bs, which is the largest group? 168 times the volume of dollars was raised under one exemption compared to the public markets. And if you look at crowdfunding, Reg CF, the new kid on the block, it was only 2% of what was raised in the public markets. Why is that? Number one, it's not that well known yet. And number two, the reason why we're having this webinar and I'm talking right now is most of us that can invest under Reg CF don't know how to do it. And we've never done it before. And neither have our families. Well, what's interesting is if you look at this graph, you look at the net worth profiles of American families, right? Starting at $10,000 on the top row, which you don't got a lot of bucks laying around if you're at that level. Unfortunately, a lot of Americans are there. What you see is the breakdown here. And it's really, uh, if you do own a home with that net worth level, most of your net worth is tied up in the equity of your home, followed by how much your car is worth. <laughs> and then third, whatever you have in, in retirement savings. The next level down is where most Americans are the hundred thousand dollars in net worth the retirement savings kind of takes over second place there but the equity in the home tends to come out number one but look what happens when you build this net worth profile the next level down is one million dollars and that's when you reach accredited status now the definition for accredited investors changes all the time the sec has a current definition of it the reality is most people have never heard that term and they don't even know they are accredited until you tell them what the definition is. But it's basically a million dollars in net worth and there's some other variables. But that's the big cutoff. But look what happens when you get down to like Elon Musk level at the bottom. The point is most of the net worth in, in households in America are, have been driven by their investments in private businesses. They've either cut checks to venture capital firms or private equity firms that then cut checks and invest on their behalf in the private businesses. Angels tend to cut checks themselves directly into companies, much like we're talking about today. But the bottom line is this, net worth has been driven largely in America through private placements and investments in private businesses. But what are we really good at? Now let's take a look at those numbers. It's just a quick joke, right? We spent $108 billion on lottery tickets last year. 108 billion, that's 6.75 times the amount of money that was raised under IPO. So there's no nobody no law that says we can't bet everything we have on lottery tickets and we do so we, we're really good at that so you know let me leave you with this it's kind of a framework to think about these three opportunities but just about supporting a privately owned business that you might want to support remember what i said about supporting and investing two different things so you know here here we see our conventional investments one way to think about it is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't say stop doing what you're doing and have always done and what your mom and dad told you to do with your money. And we're not suggesting that at all. But what we are suggesting is that it's 2024. Congress has passed new laws to allow all of us to now invest in private businesses again. You might want to crack that door open and allocate a certain percentage of your overall savings or retirement accounts or whatever, whatever, however big that is, just take a percentage of it, 5%, 10%, 10%, 20%, whatever you want that to be, and tell yourself, I'm going to invest that in alternative investments. And, you know, we have three of them here today. There are examples of this, right? And what I, now these three might not want to hear this, but what I'd recommend is that, um, 
you diversify across private companies by not putting all your eggs in one basket and by investing in a few, you're diversifying further, right? Well, the beauty of that is uh, you're creating a portion of your savings that is not correlated to the public markets. We all see on the news when the stock market takes a dive, people get an interview that their retirements have gone down and they're really worried about that. Well, one way to offset that is, is through this kind of of uh approach and speaking of retirement accounts you know one thing uh every time i tell somebody this they go i didn't know that and if i knew that uh, maybe i would invest more but you can actually use retirement funds to make some of these investments the industry has made it easy to do that our particular partner is called auto ira and if you think about investing in like one of these three companies or a private business you can do what's called a self-directed ira you can carve out a portion of an existing 401k or IRA, roll it over into a self-directed IRA and make an investment out of an IRA. And when people figure that out, they typically take that option. Here's a summary, folks. Investing in private business is new to most of us, uh, but it's, it dwarfs what happens in the public markets that we're all familiar with. You know, a hybrid kind of portfolio where you got a little bit in alternatives, um, is starting to make sense to a lot of people, you might want to think about it, right? And, you know, if we're going to invest in a private company and we are a veteran, you know, why not look at some veteran-led companies for all the reasons uh, that we talked about earlier today with the panel? So with that, I know that was a lot, but I, I, uh, I feel strongly because of what I do every day. I meet with a lot of potential investors and there's a lot of blank stares because quite frankly, a lot of us have not done a lot of these private investments and our families have. And unlike wealthy families that haven't stopped since 1933. So it's becoming more familiar. And um, so we do our best to educate people on that. And that's what you just experienced. So if you want to join the movement, you can learn more. And here's a snapshot of our website. At Fola Capital, if you hit on campaigns, you can read a lot more about all three of the offerings that we've highlighted today on our panel. And uh, you have their contact information up on the screen as well if you want to reach out to them individually. So with three minutes to spare, I'm going to shut up and see if my panelists have anything to add. Uh, I'll start with you, Carrie. Thanks, John. I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this and, and, you know, really resonated when you talked about how much we spend on the lottery as a as a country. And uh, I just want to just kind of throw this little tag out there that says, you know, don't bet on the lottery, bet on a veteran. And I, I think that, you know, we, we can do a lot of things together. We've done a lot of things together in the military. We connect well in the veteran community. And I mean, hey, you know what? The government has actually done something right and given us an opportunity where we can put our money on a veteran instead of something that, I mean, you know, put your money on a veteran, like one of us three, where you're actually going to get something back instead of just in the lottery where who knows what's going to happen. So uh, super presentation, just really glad to be here and to work with you and the other two panelists to really start sharing what we're up to and what we're doing and get the word out about the fact that common everyday Americans can actually invest in private business. So thanks, John. I really appreciate it. That's the second thing I'm going to steal from you today. So uh, Paul, we got about a 45 seconds each for you and Jeremy, and then we're going to shut down. What do you think? Yeah, you've heard me say this before. Change the narrative. I can't prove this, but I think if you ask most Americans the two most common words with veteran, they would say disabled and veteran. Change the damn narrative. Make it veteran ownership, veteran business owners, entrepreneurs. Let's change the narrative and create opportunities for vets. Love that. Thanks. Jeremy, over to you to close. No, that's great. You know, Carrie. You know, bet on a veteran and and, and Paul changed change the narrative. You know, couldn't agree more. You know, invest in veterans. You know, veterans know veterans. Um, you know what you get with, with veteran, with good veteran leaders, right? I mean, we we're problem solvers. We we have the grit, we 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 face challenges head on on a daily basis. I mean, we 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 approach things with that no-fail attitude. We are always looking at, you know, course of action one, two, three, four, and ten. You know, I mean, you, you guys, it's just, you know, veteran entrepreneurship is such a unique, you know, bucket. And it's it's a, it's an it's an excellent opportunity for investors. And and it's just great that, that we're highlighting that here with with Carrie and Paul and and everything that you guys are doing full. So thanks a lot, John. 
Thanks. Well, keep being the leaders you guys are in the community. Uh, you're a good role model for a lot of other people. So I appreciate it personally. Uh, with that, we're going to shut down early like we like to do in the military, be on time. So uh, we don't want to be late and get yelled at. Anyway, thank you for making it. Uh, if you're here live, if you're watching the recording, feel free to contact us. And thank you so much for taking some time out of your day today. Have a great day. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.